Good morning. We are now finally at the point where the Alter Rebbe will define for us what is the Bainani. And of course, this is the critical part of the, uh, of the Sefer Tanya Kadisha. This is the most important part because this is the goal. This is what we are, uh, what we are uh, challenged by the Alter Rebbe to achieve. And the Alter Rebbe says, this is the level that every Jew can accomplish. This is the level that every Jew should aspire to. So till now, <clears throat> what have we learned? We have learned that there is a inner dynamic in a human being apart from their actual behavior. There's an inner dynamic that defines the human being more so than does their external behavior. Why would we say that? Because we learned about a tzaddik, whose behavior is pristine. And we learned about a rasha, whose internal, whose, whose behavior is spoiled. Yeah, okay. We learned about a rasha, whose internal dynamic is one of tremendous struggle. The rasha struggles with regret, remorse, um, uncontrolled habits and behaviors. And that's what leads him to be a Russia. That's what makes him the Russia. That's what we discovered last week. In chapter 11, we discovered that it's not only, or it's not even so much the behavior of the Russia that makes him a Russia. It is his internal station. It's the dynamic. It's the environment in his mind and in his heart. When we ask the question about the Russia, when the Yitzhahara will throw fantasies of sin into your head, are you considering them? Never mind, are you entertaining them? Sometimes the Russia will say, I'm not even going to entertain the thought. Fine, that's fine. But would you consider actually transgressing that prohibition? Would you consider actually pursuing that fantasy? If the answer is yes, then that's a Russia. If the answer is no, then why would he be called a Russia? If the Itzahara throws a fantasy of sin into the mind of a person and the person pushes it away with both hands saying, I will not even consider transgressing this prohibition, what we can't call such a person a Russia, can we call him a tzaddik? What's the inner dynamic of the tzaddik? The inner dynamic of the tzaddik is that the Yitzhahara does not have the visa, the paperwork necessary, even to send a message into the conscious mind of the tzaddik. So here we are stuck in a dichotomy. On the one hand, the Yitzhahara is sending messages. And on the other hand, this person is not considering even for a moment, certainly not entertaining the fantasy, but he's not even considering for a moment that he would do it, that he would pursue that fantasy. So we cannot call him Russia because of his steadfast commitment to everything good and his absolute rejection of everything bad. But well, we can't call him tzaddik because he still hears the voice of his yetzer hara, his evil inclination. And what should we call this guy? We call this guy stuck in the middle. <laughs> we call this man a person who is stuck between two categories. <clears throat> He's not a tzaddik. And he's not a Russia. He is the Benini. Fascinating, because the Benini, on the outside, externally, he is a tzaddik. Internally, he's like the Russia. And that's the split. 
That is the split that leaves the Benini straddling both worlds, the world of the Tzaddik and the world of the Russia. Which <clears throat> before we even read the answer to the question in the Tanya, this is reminiscent of the vow that the soul is made to take before it's born. Be a Tzaddik and don't be a Russia. Be a Tzaddik and don't be a Russia sounds a lot like be a Benini. Right? Be a tzaddik externally, whatever you can control, that means your behavior. And don't be a Russia internally. Don't be a Russia internally means don't give yourself permission to consider sin. Don't let your guard down. Don't allow uh, the influence of negativity to achieve such strength in your life that you might actually consider a transgression. <clears throat> There's a lot to talk about and a lot to unpack, especially now that we've gotten to the meat and potatoes, especially now that we've gotten to the main section of Tanya, we will start with the Alter Rebbe's definition. What is a Bainani? The Tzemach Tzedek points out, and we we mentioned it earlier in the course, we'll mention it again, that in the sources from which the Alter Rebbe draws a lot of these ideas, <clears throat> this level of Bainani, this level of Bainani, the sources refer to as complete Tzadik. And the level complete tzaddik, we refer to it as, I'm sorry, the level that we refer to as complete tzaddik, the source is referred to as chassid. So when you see the parallels in other svarim, particularly in Shar HaKedusha of Rav Chaim Vital, where he's sharing the teachings of the Arizal in a very brief way, you'll see that tzaddik gomor, complete tzaddik, is described as what we learn here, the bain, uh, what we call here in Tanya the Bainan. Let's learn inside the Sefer. <clears throat> Chapter 12. Viha Bainani. Now, finally, let's define, let's determine, let's explain what is this Bainani. The Bainani is Shela Oilom Ein Hara Goiver Kolkach. The Benini is such a person in whom the evil never gains such strength to conquer and take control of the small city. Remember the analogy we learned from Shleim HaMelech. From where? I don't remember where it's from. Remember the analogy we learned about the two kings fighting for control over the city. There's the wise man inside the city. There are all the citizens of the city who are the limbs and organs of the city, of the body. And then there is the foolish old king who is outside the city, who is trying to gain access, and that is the Yetzir Hara. So <clears throat> there's a constant struggle in the life of this average human being who is called the Benini. Constant struggle for control between the good that is in him and the evil that is in him. Why is there evil in him? Because he has not mustered enough emotional, spiritual, holy excitement to exile the evil from inside the city. The evil is in the city. The evil is inside the city. He has gained access. He even has several seats in the Senate. And therefore, the opinion of the evil is very loudly heard in the city. But never do the citizens of the city acquiesce to the wishes of the evil. To the degree, what would it look like if the citizens of the city acquiesced? So you'll remember in our description of the Russia. In the description of the Russia, we learned that there are many kinds of Russia. There are Rishayim in whom evil occupies the driver's seat in every limb and organ. And every limb and organ in the life of this Russia is driven by the whims and wishes of the evil inclination. It's just that sometimes when the evil inclination stops off in a gas station to get a cup of coffee, 
and then goes back to driving afterwards in that slight break uh, where the conscious mind and heart of this poor Jew it gets a break from the uh, direction of the Nefesh Bahami of the evil soul, he's filled with regrets because there's goodness in him. There's a holy soul that's also fighting, hasn't given up the fight. No. There, you have a city whose citizens have all been convinced, brainwashed, um, dominated by the evil of the animal soul. And then you have a Russia of a different caliber. You have a Russia in whom he's very particular. You have a Russia in whom he will never allow his mind to be contaminated by the theories and the thoughts of the animal soul. But he cannot control his mouth. <laughs> Sometimes the things that he, that uh, it just pops out, it just pops out. Remember once upon a time by the, uh, pre by the uh, presidential correspondence dinner, which the president is meant to appear in a lighthearted, in a lighthearted manner. The president said, there are inside words and there are outside words. And just now, some out, some inside words popped out. Yeah, that happens sometimes. Never, never well considered because he does not let the Yitzhahara get control of his mental faculties. But sometimes out of his mouth comes terrible words that he didn't want to say, he didn't intend to say them, but the Yitzhahara wanted to say them and out they came. And he's filled with remorse upset and regret about those words that popped out, but he has no control over his mouth <clears throat> or his hands, like the analogies we gave in the previous lessons. The point is, sometimes you have a Russia where only one, two, three of the citizens of the city have been won over by the evil side and are obeying the commands of the, of the evil of the animal soul, while everything else is in order. Everybody else is a nice law-abiding citizen, abiding, obeying the commands of the divine soul. The Bainani is on none of those categories. He is of none of those levels. Because in the Bainani, there is not one citizen who has been won over by the influence of the evils of the animal soul. Every citizen is in line with the wishes of the divine soul, which is Torah and Mitzvahs. That means that never has the Yetzir Hara been able to get into the driver's seat of even one limb or organ in the Benini. That's a Benini. He screams, he yells, he makes protests, he stands on the highway, he holds up signs, and nobody ever listens to him. Nobody. That's a Benini. The Hainu, that means that the three garments of expression, the three vehicles of expression of the animal soul, which are the thoughts of the animal soul. What might the thoughts of the animal soul be based on our experience of learning until now? What might the animal soul want us to think? Well, if you're a Benini, the animal soul does not want you to think about, um, about absolutely putrid and awful things because he'll never win if he brings that straight to you. In the Bainani, the Yitzhahara wants you to think about benign things. Yeah? What do you call it when you have a straight line and then you veer off a single degree? There's a word for that, but I don't remember what the word is. But that's what the Yitzhahara is going to try to do. He'll try to set you off the beat, off the straight and narrow by one degree. And then another degree. And then another third. And then a fourth. Until he's got you all twisted up in a knot. And you don't even know where the straight and narrow is. And this is not something that we're unfamiliar with. This is something we experience on a regular basis. There are around us and inside of us influences that try 
by degree to change the way we think, to change the way we perceive reality, to change what we accept as true, to change what we accept as moral, just, and correct. But it's always by degree. You cannot come to a, to a Torah-based human being, a person whose morals and values are based in Judaism, and say to them, uh, everyone who cannot walk on their own, society doesn't need them. You can't start there. Because a person who is grounded in Torah's morals in a divine set of morality will reject that immediately outright. If a, yeah, because it's wrong, because it's wrong. If, uh, if evil people want to lead us that way, they have to go by degree, one tiny degree, another tiny degree. Why don't you think about yourself a little more? Maybe take care of your needs before you take care of another person's needs. More and more and more until after many, many years and many, many experiences, they might actually lead you to do something that years ago you held very strongly to the belief that that is awful and evil. And that's how it goes. So the Yetzir Hara in the Bainani would like to push some thoughts into your head. You're not going to sin. Psh, sinning is terrible. But what's so bad about fantasizing? What's so terrible about thinking? Who could it hurt? So the Nefesh Abahami, the evils of the animal soul, will want you to entertain some daydreams about things that are not related to Torah, to mitzvahs and your relationship with Hashem. Speech is the next garment and vehicle of expression. What does the Yetzir Hara want you to say or do? <laughs> you think the Yetzir Hara is going to get you right away to speak evil against another human being? Certainly not. But you could make a joke. You could make a joke about nothing. You could say something that is silly and pointless. And from there, slowly, slowly, you might even say something that you'll regret. There's a description in the previous Rebbe's memoirs of a shaykhet, a butcher, in the city of Lubavitch, who hardly spoke at all. Why? Because he didn't want to say something bad, and he figured, the less I say overall, the lower is the chance that I'll say something wrong. So he basically hardly spoke. <laughs> no. So what is, the, what is the Yetzir Hara in this guy's life going to try to convince him to do? He's going to come to me and say, going to say, Shleima Gershon, listen up, buddy boy. Go and say something derogatory and awful about your neighbor. That's a fight he'll never win. So what is the Yetzir Hara going to come to this Benini? Sorry, what is the Yetzir Hara going to come to this Benini? Shleima Gershon. The Shaykhet, and he's going to say to him, What? Shlemagershin, why don't you speak a little more? It's rude. People ask you questions and you grunt. Answer them like a mensch. Why can't you answer like a mensch? Why do you have to be so strange and so different? One degree. Shlemagershin, how come you don't greet people more effusively? Say, Good morning. How are you? How's the weather? How's your son, your neighbor, your daughter? Talk. Be a mensch. Oh. So the, the evils of the animal soul are trying to convince this Shlemegershin that in order to be a mensch, you have to talk more. Is that so terrible? But that's the Yitzhahara trying to convince you to let down your guard so that he can lead you, like they say in Yiddish, by the nose, one degree after another after another. And then in action, in action is the third garment vehicle of the animal soul. What does the animal soul want you to do? He says, dear Benini, go right now to a church and pray to Yashke Pandrik. You crazy? That's insanity. Why would I do that? It's making any sense. It's evil. I can't do that. 
go away. The, the Yitzhahara lost. The evils of the animal soul are now fighting. They picked a fight that they cannot win. No. So what is he going to do? He wants you to do something in action that's going to lead a Bainani who presently his behavior is perfect and he wants to lead the Bainani to do something wrong. Where will he start? So the pattern is the same. There was a chassid, his name is Rabbi Yitzchak Horowitz, I think his last name was. They called him Rabbi Itche the Masmid. Rabbi Itche, the hardworking one. Masmid generally is about Torah study. But Rabbi Itche, the hardworking one. And um, he came to the United States. And he had heard all of the negative reports from the United States, how Jews come here and they lose all connection with their Yiddishkeit and they lose their, because it's hard and the influences and so on. And he wanted to build a wall around his Judaism. He wanted to set a trap for his Yetzir Hara so that whenever the Yetzir Hara comes to influence him at all, he should be able to stop him in his tracks. He, yeah. It's called guerrilla, a spiritual guerrilla warfare. So what did he do? He went and bought himself an extra large yarmulke. A very, very large yarmulke. And when he came to the United States and he showed up with this extra large yarmulke, his kids and his grandkids, they said to him, come on, come on. You have to wear such a strange yarmulke. Can't you wear like a normal yarmulke? He says, I'll tell you why. Because I know that my Yitzhahara is not going to come to me and say, Itche, work on Shabbos. All the good Jewish boys and girls are working on Shabbos. You should also work on Shabbos. Obviously, in my station, my Yitzhahara is not going to come and uh, say that to me. So where will he start? He's going to start by one degree. So what's the first and easiest thing to convince a person of when he's in my position? No. So I set a trap. I made something very strange and obvious about the way I observe my Yiddishkeit so that the Yitzhahara, whenever he tries to come and attack me, he'll always have to start from that point, from the most obvious point. So every time I hear in my head, Ichila, you have to wear such a strange yarmulke, I know exactly who's talking to me and I can shut him down. <laughs> in our lives, we don't have to wear big yarmulkes. But, um, you know, before we talk about our lives, sorry, I got carried away. Started, we, we got into Fabringen mode for a sec. Let's go back into the learning mode because we're doing a definition here. The Alta Rebbe is not describing for us the path to become a, a Benini just yet. So in the definition of Benini, the Yetzir Hara, the evils of the animal soul, are going to try to convince him to allow some of the behaviors of the animal of the evils of the animal soul into the limbs of the body like what like what like change your yarmulke for something more more fashionable change your ch change your jacket to something more fashionable be uh, change the way you walk to something more cultural Change the way you do anything to be more in line with the world around you. That is the Yetzir Hara trying to gain one degree on you. I had a debate, very congenial and very friendly, with a nice Jewish boy who's preparing himself to get married and to start a Jewish home. And we had a little debate about uh, whether or not a Torah observant Jew should watch films like, what's it called? Fiddler on the Roof, right? I say Fiddler on the Roof, it's so Jewish. It reflects our culture. We should be so proud of it. The debate centers on this point. Do you want to increase the ammunition that your Yetzir Hara has in its fight against you, where it is constantly pushing to move you degree by degree to the abyss of absolute evil. If you want to increase the, if you want to increase the ammunition, what 
that's easy. Anything of this world that you consume increases the ammunition of the animal soul. Everything. And that's why no human being ever dies completely pure. Because every time we eat food, we increase ammunition. We're providing ammunition for the evils of the animal soul. Every time we go to sleep, we increase the ammunition for the evils of the animal soul. Because these are bodily functions and the animal soul is king of the body, technically. Everything that the body does, even for survival, is a notch on the belt of the animal soul. The exception, as we learned in the beginning of Tanya, is if you do it 100% for the sake of Hashem. And even then, you cannot escape the fact that the food you ate was yummy and your body delighted in that experience and gave a little boost to the evils of the animal soul. Can't be helped. And really, we're not worried about that. On our level right now, we're not worried about that. But we are defining the Bainani. So, since even the most benign human activities likely do increase the ammunition to the animal soul, you have to go out into the world and find better, sharper, more updated, more technological, technologically advanced ammunition for the animal soul by providing it images produced by non-God-fearing people. Seems a risky business. Seems to be a risk that uh, one would have to think very hard about whether or not they want to take it. Oh, but it's so Jewish sounding. It's so Jewish looking. Where are you in your journey towards Hashem? Are you in the place where Fiddler on the Roof is going to lift you closer to Hashem? Or are you in a place where a Fiddler on the Roof is... is uh, Are you in a place where Fiddler on the Roof is higher on the, ladder, on the ladder towards Hashem than you are? Or are you in a place where Fiddler on the Roof is beneath you on the ladder towards closeness with Hashem? Got to make an honest calculation. An honest calculation. When a person watches Fiddler on the Roof, are they inspired to be more Jewish than they are now? Or <laughs> some Jews, yeah, some Jews, yeah. Or a person watching Fiddler on the Roof is just looking for a distraction, for entertainment. This is not actionable advice. For a, personally, for a personal actionable advice, take this information and discuss it with your personal mentor in Judaism. We're just, we're just drawing a picture here. So the nefesh abahami, the evils of the animal soul. And I just want to be clear here. There is the animal soul itself, and then there are the evils of the animal soul. And that's not the same. The animal soul itself is called the nefesh habahamis, the animal soul. The evils of the animal soul is called the yetzer hara, the evil inclination. So whenever we say the evils of the animal soul, we're talking about the yetzer hara. The yetzer hara, the evils of the animal soul want the person to move one degree towards chaos, one degree away from holiness. And if that one degree can be achieved by, by allowing, uh, allowing ungodly images into your brain via your eyes, by dressing it in a streimel and putting a bowl of chalent in front of it, you have to be aware that that is likely. You have to be aware that that could be a trap uh, of the animal soul. And the Bainani never falls for it. The Bainani never falls for that trick. Always is aware of what the trader requires of him or her at that moment. And that is their only occupation. That's the Bainani. Let's move a little forward in the, in the uh, reading. 
Um, that the three garments of expression of the animal soul, that they are thought, speech, and action that are rooted in klipa. And klipa means what? Klipa means I exist. I have wishes. Klipa doesn't mean murder, uh, idolatry, and adultery. Also that. But that's not where it starts. Klipa means I exist. I have wishes. In the Bainani, the self-oriented, the self-directed wishes and whims of the animal soul never gain power over the godly soul. To become clothed in the body, in the mind of the person, or in the mouth of the person, or any of the limbs of the body of the person, to cause them to sin and to do something that the Torah or the Chachamim or that the code of Jewish law says, thou shalt not. Torah says, thou shalt not. The Nefesh Abahami in its, in its uh, pursuit of comfort and indulgence says, why not? Torah says not. The animal soul says, why not? I want to. I can't. You can't eat this now. It's not healthy for you. But I want to. But I want to. That is the mantra, the mantra. Is it mantra or mantra? Does it depend where you come from? Probably. <laughs> so, like that. Now, not only, if we're reading the Alta Rebbe's words carefully, not only in the, in the Benuni does the evils of the animal soul never gain traction enough to cause the person to sin, to actually do something that Jewish law says thou shalt not, but even litam'um, even just to defile them, to defile the mind, the mouth, or the limbs of the Benini. How can a person defile, how can a person defile the limbs, the mouth, the mind of a Benini, of himself or herself, without sinning? Any human activity eating, sleeping, procreation, business, sports, entertainment, so on and so forth, if they are done not in order to strengthen yourself and fulfill your obligations to Hashem in the world, but they are done out of indulgence. They are done for comfort. That is an expression of the animal soul's evils. And that defiles the soul. Are we on this level right now today that we have to worry about that? No, no, this is a definition. This is a cold academic definition of Benini. In order to understand the road that will take us from here where we are now, closer to the level of Benini, first we have to understand what is this Benini? That's what we're doing now. We are not, we are not describing our own tomorrow. <laughs> because from where we are today to this level of Benini is not tomorrow. It's after many, many days, many, many years, maybe a decade or two of hard work internally and externally till we could achieve the level Benini. So let's not worry and let's not be uh, overwhelmed by the description. Let's just understand cold and calculated as if we were in a university hearing a lecture that has nothing to do with us. Okay. Chas v'shalom, God forbid that a Benini should allow any human activity to be done by him or herself for a self-indulgent reason with self-indulgent motivations because that would cause, God forbid, the soul to become defiled. Brak Again, in the life of this Benini, it's only the three garments of the divine soul. They alone are given access to the limbs of the body. What exactly are the three garments of the divine soul? What does the divine soul wish for you to think? If you have nothing important on your mind, think words of Torah. If you have to prepare your house for Pesach, think about Pesach. 
You have to educate your children and make sure that they're safe and healthy. Think about your children. But at no time should you worry about who smacked who in Hollywood. At no time should you worry about what's happening in a world that has nothing to do with God, Torah, Judaism, or anything, or anything of value. Those are the wishes of the divine soul. The divine soul doesn't care about things that don't have eternal impact. The divine soul is not bound by time and space, and the divine soul is interested in things that are likewise not bound by time and space. Torah, mitzvahs, God, a fellow Jew, a fellow human being, a mitzvah, that's all. So what, do you, what, what does the divine soul think all day? God, Torah, mitzvahs, children, parents, neighbors, friends, the needy, what's happening in the lives of people that I have no contact with and, and never will have any contact with them? Irrelevant and a distraction. Even fellow Jews? Because I, I care about Jews I'm never going to know, never going to meet. Can you have any impact on them? Yeah. So that's why they occupy mental space. Even fellow humans, if you can have an impact on them, then the, then the divine soul is interested. If there's a fellow human being that's not Jewish, that's suffering because a tornado or a hurricane or a tsunami or an earthquake wrecked their home, and you have the resources to have some impact, physically, emotionally, spiritually, however, the divine soul is interested. But just to know what's going on in their lives for entertainment purposes, the divine soul is not interested. It's a distraction. It takes you away from your service of Hashem. It weakens the, it weakens the hold that your divine soul has on your faculties. What about the speech of the animal soul? Sorry, the, what about the speech of the divine soul? The speech of the divine soul is Torah, mitzvahs, comforting words, friendly words, educational words, helpful words. Anything, any word, any statement, any sentence that is not built on a foundation of purpose, the divine soul would never offer it. Divine soul would never offer such words to you to say them because they don't bring you closer to Hashem and they don't bring you closer to fulfilling the purpose for which you were created. So any words that are not built on an absolutely solid foundation of purpose, they don't come from the divine soul and the divine soul doesn't want you to say them. What about the actions? of the divine soul, well, the actions of the divine soul are whatever it says in the Shulchan Aruch. Whatever the code of Jewish law says, those are the behaviors of the divine soul. As this story we've already shared three times in this course. But the, in the, uh, the uh, previous Rebbe saw his father, the Rebbe Rashab, um, washing his hands in a particular way and asked, why are you doing it this way? And the answer is, since I was young, I trained my body to do only what it says in Shulchan Aruch, only what it says in the code of Jewish law. Because, <laughs> because that's how the, because he's completely devoted to his divine soul. He lives the life of his divine soul. And those are the things that divine soul would offer you to do. Those things that are recorded in the code of Jewish law. Now, says the Alter Rebbe, something shocking. The Bainani has never committed a sin in his life. And additionally, 
he will also never in the future sin. Okay, based on these two sentences, we have a very obvious question. Does such a person even exist? And the answer is, if we read the sentence literally, no, or almost no. <laughs> the more important question is not about whether or not such a person exists. The more important question is, could I ever be such a person? Well, when I was 14 years old, I sinned. So that's it for me. I'm done. I can never be a Bainini after that. Because the Bainini here is described as a person who has never sinned. And what about the fact the Alta Rebbe says the Bainini is a person who will never sin? Will never sin? The Gemara instructs even the most righteous never to, never to trust themselves to never sin. You always have to be on guard till the day that your soul leaves the body. So who is this person that he never did and never will sin? And how could I become that person? I've already sinned in my life. And I can't promise that tomorrow I'm not going to sin. And how could I become a Bainani? The Rebbe answered these questions. Today is the Rebbe's birthday. The Rebbe turns 120 years old today. Big deal. It's a very big, momentous occasion for this generation. And hopefully, as the Rebbe reaches the fullness of his lifespan, we will reach the fullness of our obedience and following his instructions to make the world a home for Hashem and to bring Mashiach immediately. The Rebbe answers this question. And the Rebbe says, think of it this way. Why does the Russia sin after he regrets his previous behavior? The Russia sins even when he regrets his previous behavior because he doesn't have the energy. His divine soul doesn't have the energy to fight. Why? The divine soul has the energy to regret. The divine soul has the energy to do tshuva. Why doesn't he have the energy to fight, to prevent such behaviors? The answer is, in the words of the Mishnah, Avera goireres Avera. One sin leads to another. If one sin leads to another, does that mean that if I start to eat, if I start to eat, um, if I started to eat yogurt too soon after I finished a meat meal, does that mean that tomorrow I'm going to break Shabbos? That's not what it means. That's not what it means. It means I did it once. It's more likely I'll do it again. The chances that I would eat milichiks, the chances that I would eat a, a dairy food soon after eating meat, before I had ever done it before, is very slim. Yeah, I'm committed to not doing that, but I've done it once now. Then it's not as unlikely that I'll do it again. What does that mean? My defenses are weakened. I am no longer in my head. You see, I'm in my head. I am no longer the kind of person that doesn't eat milk after meat. It's all going on in the head. It's all going on in your perception. I am now the kind of person who, once in a while, will make a mistake and eat milk after meat. This is a weakened, a weakened divine soul. The hold that the divine soul has on you in that, in that uh, area of milk and meat together, or milk and meat subsequently, the uh, divine soul's hold on you is weakened. It's reminiscent of the phrase, once an addict, always an addict. I've done it once. I've done it twice. I've done it three times. I'm cooked. My goose is cooked. I'm just going to keep on doing it. That is the nature of a human being. That's why we have to say that the Bainani is a person who has never sinned. What does, we, what does it mean he has never sinned? It means that he's not suffering from any of the 
natural weakness that is the product of having sinned in the past. How can a human being cure themselves from those weaknesses? How can a human being heal the pain, the brokenness, and the, the lack of trust in themselves that naturally comes from having sinned in the past? The Rebbe says there is, at the disposal of each and every Jew, profound tshuva. Not just, I'm sorry, I feel bad. Profound tshuva means I, I, I purify and I cleanse and I renew and refresh my connection to Hashem all the way down to the foundation. So that it's no longer a question of, am I the kind of person who eats meat after milk or milk after meat? That is not the question anymore. That is a small issue. And the profound tshuva that is available to every Jew is, I'm going all the way down to, am I the kind of Jew that yearns for closeness to Hashem, or am I not? And the product of, the, of this profound tshuva is the realization that, yes, I am the kind of Jew that yearns for connection and closeness to Hashem. And therefore, the fact that I sinned in the past has no effect on me. I'm over it. I'm firing on all cylinders. I'm working as hard as I can in every area of my life to strengthen and tighten my connection to Hashem. That's the Bainani's attitude. Even the Bainani who has in the past sinned, but through an intense transformation of their own perception of how they relate to Hashem, They've healed themselves of the weakness that is the natural product of sin. And therefore, they can honestly say about themselves, I don't suffer from my past sins. It's as though I have never sinned in the past. My relationship to Hashem suffers no handicap based on my previous behavior. And the same is true about the future. How can a person say, I will never sin? As long as I maintain this attitude, I will never sin. If I wake up one morning on the wrong side of the bed, yeah, and my perception of reality changes, somehow I wasn't investing enough, I wasn't spending enough time thinking the right things, maybe I took a peek into the world, the, the, uh, the world wide web of weirdness, and I got distracted, and I fell down from my present spiritual station. Yeah, that means I'm no longer a Bainani. And that's why I sinned. But if I can maintain my position, my internal dynamic, if I can maintain my perception of what's important in life, and I can keep myself on the mental level of Bainani, there's no reason that I should ever sin. Nothing would cause me to fall. Nothing would cause me to sin, to go against the word of Hashem, to do something self-indulgent, so long as I can maintain, so long as I can maintain the mentality of the Bainani. Remember, we're not describing a human being here. We are not describing a human being. We are describing a station. We're describing a, a headspace. We're describing a perception of life. Something that we can all aspire to and grow towards by degree. Just like the Eight Sahara took us on a very twisty ride, degree by degree, we can unwind our lives and get ourselves back on the straight and narrow also by degree. Now, the Alta Rebbe closes with one more shot heard around the world. What is that? That this Bainani, if you are truly in the headspace of Bainani, then you would not even be the kind of person who, was, who could ever have been referred to as Russia. In the first chapter of Tanya, the Alta Rebbe describes a variety of scenarios in which the person themselves would not have sinned. 
but they would be described as Russia. Uh, for example, they saw another sin and they had the influence to stop that person and they didn't try. In such a case, the Talmud would, would call this person by the name Russia. That's an extreme level. But that's the truth. Fine. So this means that this Bainani that we're learning about, this, the, the reality, the lifestyle, the perception, the mentality of this Bainani is not only have that, not only is that person not suffering from the weakness that would be the natural product of sin not only is he in such a position mentally and emotionally that no matter what challenge comes his or her way there is no reason there's nothing that could make that person sin they are also not suffering from any fallout that comes from being called a russia or from having failed in some spiritual task in the past Yeah. He was not called Russia, not for a moment, not for a split second throughout the days of his life. Okay. When we come back in Mirza Hashem, we will go further uh, into the, the into the uh, the description, the definition of a Bainini, particularly focusing on how come this guy is not a tzaddik. That'll be our next discussion. And with Hashem's help, we will all be back to learn in good health and happiness. Not next week, because that's Pesach, but the week after. Have yourselves a kosher and a freilich in Pesach. And now we will...